happening, something's going to happen. There's absolutely nothing down here, no movement whatsoever, yet this is telling us something. We've now got the same thing on well over 200 different patients where we get exactly the same signal a short time before tremors start. It appears to be a pretty accurate prediction that tremors are going to get going. And we're now working with Tipu on actual patients to provide this as the trigger to start off the stimulation. So the research with Tipu now is looking at what frequency do we stimulate at, how much stimulation do we apply, what's the magnitude of the voltages and, and current and so on. That's what we're looking at to make it happen, to stop the tremors. But it's interesting, because this has opened up. This is our artificial intelligence system monitoring what's going on in the human brain, and it's actually predicting what's going to happen in the brain 15 to 20 seconds before it actually happens, based on activity somewhere deep in the brain. Now, this is Parkinson's disease. So what it means is that in this thing, something happens in the person's brain, 20 seconds later, the tremors start. Intra where, what's happening there? Where are the signals going? What are the passageways? At this stage, we don't know. So we've got to try and investigate, which will give us more of an indication of what is Parkinson's disease. The same stimulator is used in a different part of the brain for epilepsy. For people that have epileptic seizures, it, it stimulates and it stops the seizure. Looking at the same data, we're getting similar sorts of predictions, but this gap is not 20 seconds. We're even getting into the minutes ahead. So we're getting an artificial intelligence system that is predicting what the human brain is going to do minutes ahead of when it does it. You have to, well, how many other things? You know, when you think about uh, having a cup of coffee <coughs> or kissing your wife or girlfriend or boyfriend or whatever it is you have, how long, you know, before you, uh, you know, maybe if there was a signal, I am going to have a cup of coffee, uh, you, you'd know you were going to do it before. Could, could you have indications what you were going to do before you did it? The same stimulator, exactly the same piece of technology, is used for people with clinical depression. And when the stimulator starts, the person describes it as a black cloud lifting. Suddenly they feel, way, isn't life wonderful? It's, it's like an electronic drug, if you like, the same sort of thing. They suddenly feel great. You can imagine our prediction. I don't know whether this will work. I mean, it's pure speculation. If you are the person with depression, you have the implant, but now we can predict when you're going to be depressed, whatever that means, and, and stimulate at that time. So there you are walking around suddenly, oh, isn't life wonderful? Oh, that means I was going to be depressed. Oh, look, oh isn't that wonderful? <laughs> Speculation. I mentioned, and there we saw <coughs> an example of technology used for therapy. Um, we're going to step out of that. The final experiments are really stepping over from therapy into enhancement because the same technology that can be used to help people therapeutically, as we've seen there, somebody that has a problem, Parkinson disease, let's use the technology to overcome that problem. But we can also use the technology potentially to enhance, to give people extra abilities. The sort of things I mean, when you look at a, a PC, um, the memory capabilities of your brain in comparison with the PC are, are minuscule. M Marvin Minsky from MIT has said, even if you live to be 100, you can download your entire memory onto a single CD. You know, he's from MIT in the US. He must be right if he says things like that. Uh, I did ask him, how did you get that? And he, I mean, the, the point is, <laughs> the point is it's, a, it's a, a finite amount of memory. Whereas when a computer is networked, it's not an infinite amount, but it's enormous memory. If you, you know, it's Wikipedia. It's everything that's out there is the memory for the computer, which clearly is. And you, you use that. You plug into that question, could you literally plug into it, directly into your brain? Would that be a possibility? Would be an enhancement. Mathematical abilities of the computer in your brain would be an enhancement. The sensory input. Um, as humans, we have five senses that gives us a very, very limited perception of what's going on in the world. We do not sense ultrasonics. We do not sense ultraviolet signals. We do not sense 
things like water vapour, different creatures. We do not sense x-rays. And so it goes on. We do not sense infrared. Your television set senses infrared signals. You don't. Doesn't that make you feel jealous when you're watching and think you can do things you can't do? Why not? Why not enhance? We have the technology. Have an infrared sense. Have an ultrasonic sense. This would be enhancement. I think most of all, for me, is communication. Because when I look at how humans communicate, it really is pathetic, we have to admit. We have these highly complex electrochemical signals here. Lots of thoughts and images, oh yeah, ideas and colours and all that sort of thing. And if I want to communicate these complex ideas across to you, what do I do? Well, I convert these complex electrochemical signals to trivial coded mechanical pressure waves. That's what my mouse does. It's very slow, very error prone. That's what it's doing now. And of course, you, you then pick them up, your ears convert back from pressure waves to electrochemical signals. And even if you've been married for 40, 50 years, you have no idea what it is your husband or wife was talking about. You just guess at it and speculate. Why not enhance? Why not link your brain to somebody else's brain? Communicate directly in a much richer form. Not in series, but in parallel. Computers communicate in parallel. Why not humans communicate in parallel? All sorts of colours, images, not just in these pressure waves, in terms of ideas and concepts and graphics and so Let's enhance. Let's go for it. Um, this shows us some of the questions. This is Campbell Aird who has, he lost his arm due to cancer, and he's been given this robot arm. But if you look, he's actually controlling his robot arm with his left hand, flicking a switch, and it changes the, the wrist, and it changes the elbow, and so on. There he goes, elbow moves. This seems a bit crazy to me. He should be controlling this robot arm directly from his brain, surely. But that would mean we need an interface between his nervous system, the, the brain, the nervous system, and the wires in the arm. So his brain signals, his neural signals, can go down the wires and move the robot hand. And when the hand grips something, signals go back up, sensory signals go back up the wires into his nervous system, into his brain, so we can get some idea what the hand is gripping. So we need an interface to be bi-directional. Brain signals down to the wires, signal from the wires up to the brain. This is therapy. It's, it's helping, it's replacing the arm that's there. It doesn't have to be an arm. This, this could be, it could be a bigger arm. It could crush cars. Why not? It's just a piece of technology. It could have wheels. It could do all sorts of things. It could have a machine gun <coughs> attached to it. <laughs> I, importantly, what we're talking about here are neural signals, not just being on the nervous system, which is a form of, of wiring, neural signals being on wires. And now, once we've got signals on wires, we can just plug onto them and send those signals where we like. So we can send these neural signals into the internet. We can send them across the internet. Your body does not have to be just where you are. Your body can be wherever the network takes you. Your brain can control things on a different continent, maybe on a different planet. And you can sense things, maybe in infrared or ultraviolet on another planet, directly in your brain that you can understand and conceive and feel in a different type of way. This is where we're getting enhancement. You, your body can go where you want it to go. Now prepare yourselves for this. A British scientist has become the world's first Bionic man. It's true. Cybernetics professor Kevin Warwick has had an implant attached to his nervous system. We'll have a look at it in a minute to discover exactly how the brain sends out signals controlling movement and even sensations such as pleasure and pain. The secret operation involves surgically inserting an implant and cable into the left arm of Professor Kevin Warwick. Well, the operation's been going about 10 minutes now. Spoken to Kevin, everything's going fine from his end, and the implant will shortly get back to the end. The implant was fired onto a main.